I think um, everybody here is here because they <laughs> know Larry Bell. They know something about Larry Bell. They have um, uh, become familiar with his art, uh, with these cubes from the 1960s that launched his career. Uh, perhaps they've seen his installations at Marva or Dia or even here at the Harwood a few years ago. They see him at openings. They know that he is a tremendously generous supporter of this community. Well, the truth is that I, when I graduated high school, I, I didn't have any uh, idea what I was going to do. And uh, uh, I didn't, wasn't a very good student in school, and I didn't really want to go into the military or get a job. But my folks told me I could go to work, go to school, go into the Army, but I couldn't stay at home anymore. <laughs> So I decided school was the. It occurred to me that if I went to an art school, maybe I could uh, get a job being an animator, since the, the school that I chose to go to was a training ground for Disney designers and animators. Aside from things like perspective drawing and, and design, basic design and figure drawing, there were classes, there were watercolor classes and oil painting classes and just regular drawing classes. And uh, it never occurred to me that I would want to be an artist. I thought I was going to, I'm going to school to get a job somewhere. Uh, my first studio was in Ocean Park, a uh, place right next to Venice, and you can see above my head there was a skylight, uh, uh, kind of a, a volume of space that uh, um, had a, a, a tented glass roof, and the, it profoundly affected the the kind of imagery that I worked with and um, the painting that you just saw in color is the image in black and white on the, on the, the against the wall that was done in 1962 trying to get a feeling of vo spatial volume in the images and then I decided that <coughs> Making pictures of uh, volumes wasn't where it was at. What I had to do was make the volumes themselves. Mm. And so uh, that's my dad. Um, he had this painting in his office. Uh, and that orange painting is behind him on the wall. That's to show you it's not a counterfeit. <laughs> He looks like a very serious, thoughtful man. He was a very funny guy. He had a great <laughs> sense of humor and uh, worked real hard all his life. He sadly died at the age of 64. Oh. So tell us about uh, the Ferris Gallery. The Ferris Gallery was the, the, the gallery that showed the cronies that were my best friends. Ken Price and Billy Al Bankston and uh, Robert Irwin and Ed Moses, uh, all, all these people that were, would become actual mentors and teachers of mine you know, through uh, the camaraderie of just hanging out together. And this image is a uh, is a, a, one of the volumes that uh, I stepped away from the canvas to make. And um, uh, there were little boxes on the other side of this box. See if the, the next picture shows. How big is that, Larry? That's around uh, a four, uh, three or four inches deep and, and 11 by 14 or something like that. And. Uh, then I got more ambitious and started making bigger boxes. And uh, 
making canvases that had glass inserts in them. I used to like to sing folk songs and I got a job at a little coffee house in Los Angeles called The Unicorn. And, uh, but my favorite type of music was the uh, Negro children's play songs that, uh, from the South. And, the rhythms and the and the, the strange little games that they suggested that kids played. Uh, little Sally Walker sitting in a saucer, weeping and moaning like a turtle dove. Rise, Sally, rise, wipe your weeping eyes. Fly to the east, fly to the west. Lie to the one you love the best. <laughs> there is a picture of Ken Price on the right, Billy Al Bankston in the middle, and me. And Caesar's Bar in Tijuana, New Mexico. <laughs> Tijuana, Mexico. This is my first show in 1962 at the Ferris Gallery. Uh, in Los Angeles, and, and uh, the two pieces on the left uh, were made from mirrors that I had scraped away as I described. The piece on the right was made by another technique which I, I sought out in the yellow pages of the Los Angeles phone book. And uh, somebody had mentioned a technique called front surface mirrors, uh, that uh, were, where the piece of glass was reflective on both sides. It was a mirror on both sides, and um, uh, one side the light interfaced with the with the, a coating of metal, and the other side light interfaced with the the glass, and so you, a quarter inch of clear glass was behind a patch of light. And um, uh, I, I like the, the sense of the, uh, the feeling of this stuff. Anyways, I found this this man this outfit that did the plating technique, and and. Uh, he made a few pieces for me. I could, it was very expensive, and I had almost no money at all. Um, but um, we managed to get a couple of pieces done that uh, wet the interest of a couple of art dealers who put out a little money to generate some inventory for a show. And uh, uh, one of them was Walter Hoffs, and the other was Irving Blum, his partner. And um, Irving Blum and Walter Hoffs introduced my work to uh, the Pace Gallery. And um, uh, actually, they, they introduced my work to a dealer named uh, Sidney Janis, who had a group show uh, called Seven New Artists, and I was one of them. And that was in 1964. And Pace was right next door, in the next building over. And, and, and uh, two fellows named uh, Arnold Blimsher and Fred Muller uh, were partners in the Pace Gallery, and they saw the show. I came back to New York for a um, for something, and went into the Pace Gallery and, and, I, and somebody recognized me from the group show that is interesting. I, when the show went to New York, several pieces broke in transit. And I had to, uh, um, we had a month or so before the show opened and I decided I would try and repair them by 
finding a glazier who could replace the broken panels of glass and somebody that did the coating that the fellow uh, uh, that I used in Los Angeles did. And I located both of those providers and we f fixed the, the parts. And, and uh, so the show went on. And the man who did the uh, coating suggested that I do it myself because it, he, he knew how much it, that process cost to have someone do it. And he, 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 see, see, he had an old piece of equipment, and that's a picture of it there with me sitting in the chair I found in a junk store. I bought this equipment and, and he gave me a book called Vacuum Deposition of Thin Films. And, sort of smugly said, you start on page one. <laughs> All the, that big thing is that you saw was, is a bottle. It's a big empty bottle made of stainless steel. And it's possible to remove the air from it by a, a bunch of kind of technical pumps. And, um, and there are processes that can be done in an environment that has no oxygen that can't be done in the presence of air. As simple as that. Mm -hmm. And um, one of those things is uh, to, is the evaporation of various metals or non-metallic materials. And uh, it, the industry of thin films uh, was, <coughs> was just going nuts in those days. It, it, I ordered it in 1968, and it came in 1970, uh, 1969. Hmm? It's, it's uh, 12 foot, 12 foot between the, the dish bins and a uh, 7 foot diameter. And the, the, the first one that I bought in New York was a bell jar that was a uh, uh, 36 inch diameter. And it was hoisted up off of that working base plate. Um, the, the person that that's the piece being offloaded to my studio in Venice. Um, uh, yeah, this was, it was a it was a company that m makes this kind of equipment. Um, that's what they do is make equipment that utilizes vacuum and uh, uh, <coughs> just about everything in our modern world functions through processes done by equipment like this. Your telephone, television sets, windows in big buildings. Everything has a thin coating of something on it that allows your telephone, when you dial little connections on little chips that are all made in vacuum situations. And, and, um, uh, and I'm still using it. It's uh, 53 years old now and, and runs like thermal. It's a high vacuum, it was built as a high vacuum thermal evaporator. It's the, the actually, actual title of the device. But we no longer do thermal evaporations in it. We're developing a new technique for us. Uh, called sputtering, which is a different kind of way of transferring material from one place to another. And the um, uh, University of uh, Fort Collins, um, Colorado, had a department of high energy physics, and, and um, the, the, this technique called sputtering was. Uh, one of the byproducts of potential use of high energy physics and, and, and industrial processing and so on. It all has to do with moving something from one place to another place. And, and uh, 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 one of the students that I met when I was up there graduated and he called me up saying he wanted a job and he came down and helped build the first sputtering system. And uh, Jack is here. 
in the back here. Why don't you stand up for a minute so people can have a look at what you There was an exhibition of young artists from Los Angeles at the Tate Gallery in London, and uh, uh, this <clears throat> I decided to repeat a, a piece that was developed in my studio uh, as an exercise for my eyes, and um, uh, we made a, a very dark room with a with a, a, a couple of reflective pieces of glass, round tubing, that were placed in the room that would reflect a light from another place uh, in, this, in the room. The rods could see where there was another light where my eye could not see where there was another light. <laughs> and so the reflection of that light that I could not see was in the room. And, and because if I took a, a step toward that reflected light, I was actually moving away from the source of the light, and so the reflection appeared to move away, equal to the distance that I moved toward it, until finally I banged my head on the wall. Uh, well, you were there with uh, Robert Irwin and Doug Wheeler? Yes. And didn't you tell me they, they were there a little bit ahead of you and got the best faces? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's true. And they and I got there and there was only one space left for that I could use, but I could do anything I wanted with it. And I just figured the same a phenomena that I had done in a, a a room that was shaped somewhat like a shoebox um, would work for in the same manner, which I was wrong. And uh, it didn't work in the same manner, and I was terribly distraught uh, at the time of the opening. That that yeah. sort of rotunda area that we walled it, made it into a round room, stretched a black uh, sheet across the top of it, and and baffled all the lights. And, and uh, there was one spot in the uh, room that, uh, that where we put the light source, which was simply a line that was illuminated by a, a, a framing spot, and it didn't work. The, the line that I was expecting to see floating in space that, in the other space that I'd seen that. Uh, the reason that I, that I built this thing in the first place was to teach my eyes how to uh, accustom, to how to uh, uh, pupils to dilate fast in the dark space. I wanted to be able to see immediately. Uh, and somebody mentioned something to me uh, about an inst an Indian tribe that in South America somewhere, and they had a ritual war with another tribe across the river. Every year they'd get together and, and beat, a, beat on each other until somebody died. And then it was all over. And, and, uh, uh, but this particular tribe had the ability to close the wounds by muscle contraction. They were able to stop the bleeding from a wound by knowing how to control the muscles that were torn. And um, uh, so I got to thinking about that story and I said, well, if it's possible to control the muscles from a fever, it might be possible to control the pupil dilation if I could feel those muscles. Mm -hmm. And so, in, um, in a period of time, we, I had an assistant who would place these reflective rods in different places in, in the room, and my job was to go in the room and see the reflective line. 
as fast as possible. And, and um, uh, so I found that, it, that actually, by trying to do that, it did work. But I didn't know, I, there was no feeling that I had about it. It was, uh, it was seeing it that, I would, that was the uh, sensory thing. And it was totally sensory. There wasn't any intellectual stuff that went along with it. It was just a, a feeling of a feeling. Mm -hmm. Anyways, the what I described as the phenomena that was supposed to happen in the place didn't happen. There were no white lines floating in the air. Mm -hmm. And I was very despondent at that moment when I realized I screwed up and lived that. And, uh, and as I'm walking out of the room, there was some of the black fabric that had been stretched across to darken the space in front of me. I kicked it out of the way, and there was the line. There was the And, uh, uh, so, you know, all, all of a sudden I was redeemed. It, it, it just, things were different in different spaces. Yeah. You know, I was too naive and, and greedy to think about it, but in fact it worked just great. And I walked out of there happy as a clown. And, uh, so how did you get the house? I came to visit Kenny. And uh, ended up staying. <laughs> Ken Price moved here before I did. I went out to see him, and uh, <clears throat> Janet went with me, and we went, and we ended up staying here. What year was that? That was '73. Yeah. Yeah. That you were interested in. Yeah. 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 My my studio was was uh, the the only commercial library in northern New Mexico. <laughs> This is something that was I uh, found to be very satisfying to make, which is uh, uh, these were constructed images. Of each of those ellipses was cut out of another piece of paper and then put into a, a hole in the page plane so that the um, uh, the, the, you couldn't see that they were separate pieces. The, the cuts had to be exactly um, right, and uh, they were a pain in the ass to make. But they, but they were really beautiful in in their presence. And um, that shape um, had, to me, some metaphysical significance in that it was the uh, the same angle uh, ellipse as the Andromeda galaxy, mm -hmm. which pulls a lot of pressure on our Earth. This is a, the furniture is, is another one of the things I got involved in, and it was based on, um, again, the, I found an old chair in a junk store in New York, which I uh, kept for years with, with the plan of making more of it, just like it, and, and ended up uh, um, making uh, a whole suite of furniture based on the shapes of the profile of the chair, which is one quarter of a 40 degree ellipse, which is the same Ellipse uh, is the Andromeda Galaxy. It was a dear friend named Eric Orr who um, we collaborated on works before and seated to my right was the beautiful Janet Webb. <laughs> so, uh, this is an installation from uh, uh, a show I did at, in the city of Nîmes in France, and, and uh, this, uh, it was a period when things were real rough in terms of finances, and I didn't have 
really working capital. Um, and so I started cutting up things that I had already made and recycling them then into mm -hmm. new compositions, small compositions. So I, I worked on this project for five years and the goal was to make 10,000 unique images. And uh, uh, I called these sculptures light knots. They hang from the ceiling. They're a piece of mylar that has been coated uh, in a totally spontaneous manner. Uh, I, I take a sheet of mylar that might be uh, uh, four foot wide by five foot tall and cut a few lines in the, in the surface and then take a corner of the mylar and twist it. In other words, poke it through one of the cuts that I made in the paper and maybe do it again and, and then hang it. And so the curves were just, oh, happened uh, totally spontaneously. This is another example of, of the coding technique being used to color collage elements that um, were plated in the same manner as the light knots were. Randomly twisted and then coated. And when I opened up the coated surface and laid it flat again, it had a memory of the condition it was in when it faced the vapor streams. And um, uh, so what looks like it's curved is actually flat. And, but it was curved when the plating took place. So, um, so the energy that, it's always been my feeling that when an artist puts his hands on a particular kind of material, he imparts a, 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 a very special kind of energy to that material. Whether it's any good or not, the energy is still trapped in the material placed on that surface that was chosen by that artist. And, and it's very possible to release it at any time, but you got to have the key. And the key is simply something that happens in your head. And you tear it in half and look at it, and all of a sudden it becomes a real something else. And, uh, and so intuition, spontaneity, and improvisation are the three most important tools in my studio. And I think that's the same for just about any artist. And, uh, and I want to make this the last picture that we talk about. This is up in, in uh, it's one of my glass pieces up in Dia Beacon, New York. And um, uh, the floor in this room was terribly uneven. I wanted to do a show at, at Beacon, but um, uh, I, I insisted that, that we put a carpet down because I wanted these glass parts to be able to sit firmly on the floor. And um, the floor was highs and lows and so on and so forth. Well, the carpet sort of shims up underneath everything and, and will hold old parts safely. Well, the institution didn't want to do a carpet. It was, they wanted, they were very minimally uh, focused and somehow carpets were not part of their aesthetic at all. And um, so I just told them, if we don't get the carpet, um, I can't do the show. And we set up, we made full-size model of the of the piece out of corrugated board and taped it together and set it down in the room where uh, the, the glass was to go and it, it was quite clear that most of the glass was floating in the air and, and so they said okay you can, you can have your carpet. <laughs> what color do you want? Just in that instant one of the curators walked by and was wearing a sweater that color. That's the color. And there it is. It's 
did some wonderful things that I didn't know that way it was going to do. It reflected off of you see the pink on the ceiling at, 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 at different times of day, but it's, the, 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 there's a haunting, there's like a ghost of something out there. And, uh, so, anyways. I think we better cut it off. I think you have to do it. Oh, it's so much fun. Thank you.